Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and I have the honor of sitting with the man who may become the next president of Peru, Julio Guzman, who's already twice served as deputy prime minister in the Peruvian government. Currently, Julio is a vice minister of industry in the government of President Humala. You should know that Julio Guzman has some profound connections to the United States. His wife is an American. She's also Jewish. And he earned both his master's and his doctorate at U.S. universities with a master's from Georgetown University Public Policy Institute and a Ph.D. in public policy from the University of Maryland. Before becoming a major figure in the Peruvian government, Julio worked for 10 years in Washington, D.C. with the Inter-American Development Bank, the IDB. And Julio Guzman has long been extremely involved in helping to address the needs of the poor and the effects of globalization on the poor. And Julio Guzman, it is so wonderful to have you at this table. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm really, really happy. Thank you. Why are you in the United States these days? Well, I'm having uh, several uh, meetings here uh, for the campaign for POSIS to meet uh, new people, to make uh, new connections, uh, to, to try to gain support for me candidacy. And I am running for president of Peru. The elections are going to be in April 2016. So it's really important for me to, to, to meet new people, and particularly people who support the principles I support. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand there are likely to be four other candidates, something like that, who may run in this election. And many of them have been already past presidents of Peru, correct? That's right. Okay. Does this put you at some kind of disadvantage? Well, it depends on how you s see that, because... Uh, it's true that the three of them are on the top, but the three of them are involved in corruption cases. Indeed, the, per, uh, the Peruvians right now are really, um, are really sensitive to what happened in the country. Corruption has achieved a really high levels. And now 60% of the population, according to the recent polls, are saying that they don't want to vote for any of those three. So that means that they are waiting for someone new. Mm -hmm. And this is the place that I would like to take. I, my candidacy was launched publicly. My campaign started two years ago, but my candidacy was published just uh, two months ago, and already I already have 1% of the, of the votes. Mm -hmm. And I am now in the fifth and sixth position in the pools. Mm -hmm. So that means that the potential my candidacy has is really, really significant that because, because of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that the election that's to, play, to take place in April decides, in essence, the f two front runners who then run again. Is that correct? That's right. We have a second round. The first one is the two first, and then the second round to decide who is okay. going to be the winner. So your challenge is to come in at least second. Exactly. Okay. Um, who's supporting you in Peru? Well, there is, a, according to our studies, Young people in Peru are the most uh, excited about our candidacy. Young people. Young people and women. And why? Why? Because the, the candidates that are running uh, now are pretty, you know, they have been former presidents. They, are, um, they have a, a very uh, uh, old vision of what Peru should be. And the only one who is a young one who has been studying abroad, who has this international perspective, and who want to be the bridge between the past and the future of Peru is my case. Yes. So this is wonderful because young people in Peru have a different kind of uh, mindset in, not only because they are young, but because we need to be, um, we need to understand that Peru comes from a very, very difficult times. We live in terrorism, we have instability, we had huge uh, percentage of poverty, 60% 30 years ago. So people from all generations are survivors, and survivors think differently about the world. Young people in Peru 
are not only important because they are young, but because they um, experience economic growth in the last 10 years. That means that they are start believing in themselves. Mm -hmm. That believes that they are not uh, improvising, but they are planning ahead. So they are ready to take the step to the future. They don't want these old guys who think about the past and they have been survivors. Mm -hmm. They want a nation that wants to progress. In that circumstance, a candidacy like mine fits perfectly with mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. I don't know really much about, I don't know anything about Peruvian government, mm -hmm. Peruvian politics. I know nothing about, I, my imagination is nobody watching JBS right now has a clue of what Peruvian politics are about. But in America, we know how politics works. You know, most Americans have a very dim view of American politicians. Politicians world, worldwide right now are suffering a real crisis of confidence in terms of the way the, their electorates, their populists view them. But we also know that politics needs money. If you run for any office here in the United States, you need money, 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 and money. In, people are very upset with the extent to which money rules politics today. I'm assuming there's something similar in Peru. I'm assuming if you run for president, you need enough financial support. And I'm wondering where you feel your financial base is in Peru. And then you are honest to say one of the reasons why you're visiting the United States is to also try to garner support here in America. But tell me about where, where in the world, who's supporting you financially, and where are you in facing that problem? Okay, so one of the challenges we are facing now is financial, the financial issue. And why? Because of two reasons. The first one is because we don't want to be conditioned to any business or industry in Peru. Because one of the problems in corruption in Peru is that most politicians are already involved to those businesses. Mm -hmm. So if I really want to do something different, I would like, to, I wanted to be independent yes. in that way. So when I start thinking about this project, I was thinking I need to look for help abroad. Why? Because abroad, particularly in my experience in Washington DC and the United States, there are people who want to support good causes. They are not linked uh, you know, financially to Peru, but they are linked because of principles. They want to support principles and values. And that's really strange in countries like Peru, in which businesses are business oriented and that's it. So I started this several months ago to come to find friends in the US, friends who understand that I've been living in the States, I was educated here, my family is American, but my family is also Jewish and I have values that I'm not gonna change. And it's incredible, but ironically, I think I will find more friends here than in my own country in this stage. Mm -hmm. And the second reason is that I need to go up in the pools in order to be like a realistic for Peruvians option. But you know, it's incredible that they made an analysis of my candidacy and they cannot see the potential and the future that I have. It's incredible how many times I came to the U.S. and I find more open doors than I found uh, in my own country. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the short vision mm -hmm. perspective mm -hmm. that I was told you uh, about. Peru has been lived under so intense, difficult times in the last 30 years that the mentality of the Peruvians that, that now own the businesses are really like flat. And we don't want that in Peru. My support is for young people that unfortunately they don't have the money right now, but they are the base of the borders. 60%, 60% of the borders in Peru are people under four years. So that's the potential. I've been in the public for two months and I have achieved much more support than people that are 20 years mm -hmm, in politics. Mm -hmm. So I want people that not only share my values and my principles, but I also see the potential that I have for a country, for Peru. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be the first president in, in Peru, Mark, the first one, not only with my age, but also who supports civil rights. It's gonna be the first pro-civil rights presidency in the history of Peru, and this is really remarkable. I'm gonna be the first president in Peru who not only uh, is, a, is a friend of the Israeli cause, is more than a friend, because I not only share a family, but I am informed 
one of the problems in Latin America, Mark, nobody knows what is going on in the Middle East. And this could be a disadvantage, but also could be an opportunity. Because if you have so many countries that are neutral to what's going on, that means that you invest a little more of time, our more negotiation, and very smart ways of getting that continent in support of the cause, you can do something really interesting. Mm -hmm. So what I'm looking here is exactly that. People who think differently and who could see you know, beyond their eyes and could imagine the potential that this candidacy has, not only for Peru and Latin America, but also for the, causes, for the causes of the Jewish community. Well, that is lovely and beautifully said, Julio. So I want to know a little bit about you personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've already said, and you've already said, so your wife is Jewish. Yes. You study at Georgetown, you study at Maryland. What's your own family background? Who were your mother and father? What kind of home did you grow up in, which ultimately brought you to a point in your own life where you came to the United States to do your graduate studies? Yeah. My parents came from the mountains, which is um, really interesting in Peru because uh, the mountains is uh, uh, generally related to poverty and to margina marginalization. My, my dad is from Cusco, the center of the power in the Inca Empire. And, my, and the family of my mom is from Caxamarca, who is the second place, the, most se the second most powerful place in the Inca Empire, Cajamarca. So those places has a very strong uh, meaning. And what was their religious background? Uh, they were Cat uh, Catholic. So were you raised as a Catholic? Yes, I was raised as a Catholic, but I had a problem. What's your problem? I, was, <laughs> I, I live in Lima. I live in Lima. I grew up in Lima with this sense of uh, uh, national territory, not only uh, uh, in, in, in the Limeño perspective, the guy who lives in Lima who believes that Lima is Peru and is not. <laughs> but one of the things that struck me um, uh, living there is that I question almost everything since I was a child. And in my community, that is not always right. right. I value education since I was a boy because my father told me to do that. And it really, this is really strange because people try just to survive and try to live you know, the day by day. They don't see the future. And the third one, who was really interesting, is was I have a social responsibility to my community, always since I was a boy. So, which is interesting is that the first person I met that shared all these values was my wife who is Jewish. I've been talking to my wife, and I ask her, what, what do you think are the Jewish values in life? And she told me, very clearly, family, responsibility to your community, um, education, and question is OK. So that's why, you know, that's why I feel so comfortable with her, mm -hmm. because I was living as a boy in a community that didn't understand so much the values that I grew up because of my father. Mm -hmm. My father taught me that. You were lucky to have your father. What was your father's name? My father was Julio, but he left me very early. Uh, I lost my father at 14 years old. I'm very sorry. But it was enough for him to, to give me these values. Yes. And your mother? My mother is still alive. Um, Her name? Gloria. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Ele uh, Eleven. You are one of 12? Yes, and I am the 11th. We are six sisters, six brothers. I am the 11th. Was it hard being the 11th of 12 children? Absolutely, because competition was always in my life. I needed to compete for attention from my parents. I needed to compete for uh, you know, resources, even food. I need to compete for- Even food? Yeah, because we were 12, and Peru, you know, 34 years ago, it was a really, you know, messy country. Uh, I'm telling you, there was a day, if I had my meal one day, let's, let's say uh, Monday, I didn't know if Tuesday I'm going to have a meal. Oh. I went to school with the same clothes year by year, you know, three years in a row, because there were no money for, uh, for that. Are you saying that your family was uh, on the poorer side? No, I didn't know. My family was uh, the middle class, lower middle class. And you still, then why was there a problem with food or clothing? Because instability. The problem of middle class in Peru at that time is, is not uh, lack of resources. It's instability and lack of predictability. 
that means that one day you can have you know everything you wanted, and the next day, nothing. By the way, as a child, did you understand this, or did you just experience it? In my mind, I say to myself, for a child, it would make life seem somewhat frightening and unpredictable. That that ultimately, you now, as an adult, are able to analyze it. But how did you experience this as a child, Julio? Well, as a child, that made me strong. That circumstances made me strong. You have two choices in life. If you go through those experiences, you said, oh, poor of me, I am a victim of the system. And the other option is, I'm going to do something about it. And I did the second one. So I get really strong. And not only strong and resilient as a person, but I start to planify everything. Because planification was the only way to get out of there. So I start working at 15 years old. Once my dad passed away, I started working to put food in my family's table. And since 15 years old, I, st I never stopped to try to reach my goals based on planification and what I want about life. So just to finish the question that you asked me about how I engage with the US, when I, uh, when I finished my high school with a scholarship because my dad passed away, I decided to be in the best universities in the okay. world. Okay. You say you competed with your other 11 siblings. Yes. There's one child even younger than you. Who? Who's, who's the younger child? Francisco. The, Francisco. Okay. One more. How many boys and girls are there? Six, six. Six and six. Either did the competition you experienced create distance between you? I wonder the extent to which the 12 of you were a bonded group. To what extent were you in some way all isolated? How was it when you were a child? How is it today? Well, it was interesting. The relationship with the oldest one was protection. I protect him. You protect the oldest one? No. The, as the mm, older one? I, as the, I was the 11th. So you protected the 12th? Yes. Got it. Yes, I protected the 12th, okay. but it's incredible because I remember that in order to survive, I made alliances with my sisters, the older one. Why? Because they were so sensitive about children. They were uh, youngsters. They were uh, adolescents at that time when I was a little kid. So they had this motherhood uh, sense, right? So I made alliances with the two oldest ones. What did that mean? That means that, you know, I was affectionate with them. If they want me to sing, I was singing or dancing or whatever. I was like, uh, oh, my little boy. And that helped me a lot in order to go through that way. Mm -hmm. Because it's really difficult. When you have 12 children, the parents are not around you because they are focused on you know, feeding you. And after my dad uh, passed away, the situation was worse, was, was really worse. But the dynamic on a family like that is really interesting because it shaped your personality. Mm -hmm. And it depends how you do it with that. So how, how did it shape your personality? It made me a very, uh, as I told you, really, really strong. Really strong because I need to deal every single day with something new and hard. It made me really attentive. Were you, this is a silly phrase, but you'll understand what I mean. Did you become the man of the family after your father died? In some way, yes. In some what way, about yes. your older brothers? Well, again, I think, uh, I think uh, the situation is the same for everybody, but it depends on you. What is the choice, the choice that, you, that you take? I remember that all my siblings told me along the years that while they were doing you know, different kind of stuff, you were studying. Oh, Julio, after my dad passed away, we couldn't, you know, be with you in a, in a family reunion. We can go partying with you because everybody, where's Julio? Studying. I was always studying. And now what happened? I was the one who went farther mm -hmm. because I was planifying, because I always knew what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted it was my father taught me. Again, social responsibility to your community, education, and you need to question everything. 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 Every single day. Okay, so let's come to that for one moment. You grew up in a very traditional Catholic world. Yeah. Yes? Yes. And it's, I'm not in any way suggesting that, that there are not Catholics who are questioning all the time. But in your community, 
questioning the religious tenets of Catholicism was not something that was all around you. What kind of problems did it create for you in terms of maybe with your siblings or your friends or your community or your school? What kind of problems did it create for you that you were the kind of person who insisted on questioning even the beliefs and faiths that were so central to so many in your community? Yeah. The first is was not being understood because I wanted to transform everything to, to get it better. Why we're doing this if we can do this better? Why you're using this if you can do better? Why do you think that way better? So sometimes I felt that people get offended because you wanted to change everything for better. And most people, I notice that now that I am you know, in my 40s, that most people don't want change. They don't like change. Even if they are not happy enough, they don't want change because they don't know what is going to be in the future. So they don't want to risk and they, don't want, and they want to live in their comfort zone. So one of the problems that I had is that I didn't find a way to convince most of the people to make the change. And now that I am in my 40s, I think I understand much better. And I have a different strategy. And the strategy is, you know what? Your status quo, it's OK. It's nice. We're living well. But if we make this little improvement, we can change progressively to a better world. Mm -hmm. And you know what? You are not responsible for what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. You are not responsible. But you can make the difference. And I'm going to change. I'm going to help you, not me, you and I to make that change for you to be mm -hmm. OK. You know, there's so much Jewishness when you speak. <laughs> it's amazing to me. So now tell me, how do you come to America? Well, once I was in Lima, I decided to study in the best Peruvian university, which was, I was really crazy, according to most people, because I didn't have the money. And it was really, really difficult to get there in the Catholic University of Peru, where I didn't listen. And I just apply, apply, apply. I get to the, to the university, and then I start working part time to pay the university. So what I did, if I was a freshman, I I uh, I, te I taught uh, mathematics to a little kids, you know, primary school, high school, and then I funded the university. I pay my university. I study two more years because I was working and studying at the same time. But after finishing the university, the, the undergrad, well, I'm going to go to the best universities in the world. So my friends, again, tell me, Julio, I thought you were crazy. Now I am convinced you are crazy because you don't speak Spanish. You don't speak English. The universities in the US are really, really difficult to get in, and you don't have the money. How are you going to resolve that? So I said, I'm going to start English right now. And in three years, I finish my, the degree, the necessary degree to try to apply to the international exam. Then I applied to five top universities in the U.S., and two of them accepted me, Syracuse and Georgetown. Wonderful. So I get to Georgetown, and I didn't have the money again. So I say, how am I going to do that? Did you have family in America? Nope. You're alone? Yes, alone. What did you do? I went to the university, and I took to the director of the program, to the public policy program. And I said to her, you know what? I've been admitted to the university, here's the proof, but I don't have any money. So what I'm going to do? I'm going to be really transparent and honest with you. I don't have the money. So she analyzed my case. She started laughing. And she didn't you know, understand how a guy like me was talking in that way. And she told me, I'm going to help you with one condition. I'm going to help you because I know a fund in the university that helps these cases. But the condition is that you get the best grades you can. So I got a student loan. I finished my master, and then I paid the loan. And I had a very good grace in the university, and I finished my master's. But the story didn't end up there, because and then I decided to make my PhD again. And I didn't have the money again, and I wasn't accepted to the university. So I applied to different universities. I applied, uh, uh, in this case, to the University of Maryland. I was accepted from a very, it was like six, 600 people around the world applying to the university. And I was one of eight that was uh, accepted. 
And then I talk again to the university guys and tell them, you know what, I don't have the money. I was accepted. And my story, my personal story is this one. And they again told me, we're going to help you. In this time, we're not going to give you a student loan, but I'm going to give you a scholarship, full scholarship. So I was surprised, and I was amazed. And I finished my PhD, and I finished my PhD with 3.9 score. Wow. Which is in public policy. In public policy. That is a marvelous story. In Hebrew, we say, kol kavod, all honor to you. Oh, thank you. And it's clear you're a very unusual person. You're both bright, and there's a loveliness to you that's extraordinary. So I am not surprised, but I'm happy for you that people recognized how unique you were. And where along the way do you, do you meet the Jewish woman who becomes your wife? Well, well once um, I, I was studying and finishing my PhD, I started working at the IDB, at the Inter-American Development Bank, for several years. I was advising several countries in Latin America, and one of them was Peru. And uh, I was divorced um, several years uh, uh, earlier. That. Yeah, earlier. And, um, and I met Michelle. I met Michelle, I remember it was a really, really hot day. Uh, we met in Washington, D.C. And uh, it was really interesting with, because in our first meeting, uh, I knew, of course, that she was Jewish. But How did you know? Why? How did you Because know? we were talking about that, and she okay. told me that uh, she was Jewish. But it's, it surprised me, because uh, she was dating a Catholic man. And in Peru, the Jewish community is relatively close. So it's not so, um, you know, it's, it's not so easy uh, to get involved. The to Jews of Peru don't tend to date Catholics. Yeah, I will say that, I don't say that 100%, but it's, uh, it's not common. Yes. It's not common. It's a relatively close and community. And in Peru, you had never, did you date in general? Did mm. you have girlfriends? Oh, yeah, yeah oh, in yeah. Peru, of course, yes, but not Jewish. Of course. It was, my, it, w it was the first time okay. I was meeting uh, someone from the Jewish community in that, in that circumstance. And I want to say, when you, this was not the first Jew you ever met, but it was the first Jew you ever dated. Is correct. that correct? Okay. Correct. All right. Correct. Correct. So I was asking her, may I ask you a, a question? Yes. Um, why are you dating me if I am Catholic? And she started laughing and laughing and laughing. Why are you asking me that, that question? So I explained to her my experience with the Jewish community in Peru. And, and she explained to me you know, uh, that here in, this, in the United States, things are different, are totally different. And um, after my first meeting, I knew it. I knew she, wants, she, wanted, she, she was the one. Really? Really. What, what you know, captivated you? Um, she was curious about everything. She was curious about everything. She was asking different kind of questions, uh, not about just myself, but in general, every single topic we were discussing, the creativity, the, uh, that was really important. The second one, the generosity. Generosity. Gen generosity. She was telling me about a kid that she was taking care of. And that is, is struck me because uh, you know, part of her time was devoting to to a kid in need. On the other hand, she was telling me about uh, her school, uh, Wellesley. She studied at Wellesley, which is a really, really high level university, and she was involved even after that. So, so the sense of, of involvement around her uh, liked me a lot. Mm -hmm. The sense of family. He told me about her brother who has really, really close ties with her brother and their family, which is really strange, uh, you know, uh, this kind of situation. So also, she's really beautiful. I'm she sure. Has, she has a amazing green eyes, <laughs> an amazing smile. And I knew it from the very beginning. Did she like you? <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, I think so. Good for both of I you. I think so. I think so. So how long did you go together before you got married? Uh, two years. Very lovely. We're together for two years. How many children years. do you have? One. One daughter. One daughter, Claire. Claire Laura. Claire, who is Jewish. Yes, absolutely. Okay. How did your mother and your siblings feel about the fact well, that, that all of a sudden, Julio was going to marry somebody who was not Catholic? What did well, I'm going to describe this uh, in one anecdote. My mother was in Washington, D.C., visiting me just uh, 
weeks after I met Michelle for the first time. And I was driving, and I didn't know what, what to tell my mother because she's really Catholic. She's really Catholic. And this was huge for, uh, for uh, her. So I was driving, and I tell my mom, Mom, uh, what about if uh, I'm not dating a Catholic woman? What is, uh, what is the best, uh, you know, what is the, the, the second best for you? And she immediately responded and said, Jewish. Immediately. And I was surprised because I didn't know why. And she responded telling me, because Jesus was Jewish and we came from them. And we, not, we came not from Jesus, we came from them. And I love that response because it was so automatic, it was so quick. So I then get strong and tell my mom, Mom, I wanted to know that I am dating Michelle. And she was uh, happy be just because of that I was meeting someone. And then when she met Michelle, now they are really, really, really close. That's lovely. Really, really close. And uh, I'm really um, thankful. I'm really thankful for that. But I would like to tell you something else, that after meeting Michelle and living so many years in the States, I returned to Peru to be Vice Minister of Industry and then Deputy Prime Minister of Peru. But that was is not important. Which is important is when I returned to Peru, I was having different values because of the things that I was uh, uh, seeing in the U United States, but also because of my relationship with Michelle. So when I returned to Peru, the people who were around me, the closest one, are also from the Jewish community. Really? Now, I have three coaches. Three coaches and one mentor. A mentor who is helping me through all the campaign from the very beginning. And three coaches that are helping me to be a better person. Because being prepared for a political campaign is not about to get prepared to deal with people. It's about to be a better person inside of you. And all of these guys, the four of them, are from the Jewish community. And let me tell you one thing more. I didn't meet them because of Michelle. It wasn't that I returned to Peru and Michelle, oh, I'm going to introduce to you all these guys. No. I meet them separately. So this is not circumstantial. Mm -hmm. This is not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. This is just values and principles that link you closely with people. So for me, it's not luck. It's just that when you are there, you get close to people who resemble you, your values and your principles. That's why I think this is a huge opportunity for many people, not only America, but the Jewish community too. And this is going to be the first time, it's going to be the first time in which a president is going to hold this principle. Democracy, civil rights, tolerance, and understand the, Ill, the, the problem in the Middle East in a broader way. Mm -hmm. Because when people don't know anything about a problem, they react like randomly. I'm not going to react randomly with the problem of the Middle East because I am already informed about what's going on there. You know, Julio, in America, and, and in some way Michelle is telling you this, there's an enormous spectrum of Jewish involvement. Yes. From Jews who are basically not engaged at all in Jewish life to Orthodox Jews, Reformed Jews, Reconstructionist Jews, Conservative Jews, Chavurah Jews, um, academically oriented Zionist Jews. I mean, there's a, there's a rainbow of Jewish right. life here in America. And they, again, there are also assimilated Jews who are Jewish, know they're Jewish, but it means nothing to them. And I, where does Michelle fall on that? To what extent is Jewishness important to her in any way? And at the moment, if someone were to say to you, so Ulio, are you bringing your child up as a Jew, your daughter up as a Jew? Or are you bringing her up uh, with, you know, as in a universalist fashion? She has a Catholic father. She has a Jewish mother. And, you know, it's, it's some nebulous type of bringing the child up. How would you identify Michelle's Jewish identity? And do you feel you and she together now have a Jewish identity that you want to impart to Claire? Yes. Um, for Michelle, being Jewish is really, really important. It's in every single day of her life. 
we go to the synagogue, we do all the, we experience all the tradition, and she's not only that, she's pro-Israel too, which is, as you said, is really different here in the Jewish community. My daughter is going to be raised Jewish. She is. Yes. That does not bother you? No. Does that bother your mother? Absolutely not. So, Absolutely not. Okay, and one more question. You understand, for people watching, this is such an interesting your, 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 your life's journey is so fascinating, Leo. Does it ever occur, uh, occur to you that you want to become a Jew formally yourself? You know, there's so much about you that feels Jewish, but you have never made a formal decision to become part of the Jewish community. Is it at all conceivable to you that you would one day want to become part of the Jewish community and convert and become a Jew? I thought about it more than one time, and with my wife too. But one of the things that I understood about being Jewish is that you need to be ready and prepared, and it's not easy to get into the Jewish community because in other religions, they are like proactive to get you involved. In the Jewish community, it's different. We don't want you, we're not gonna force you to be part of us, but if you want to be part of us, we need to be sure that you wanna be part of us. So that time, is not now, but I know what it means. And the time when, if I made a decision, I'm gonna be, I need to be, I need to feel that I'm ready. And, and you're not ready, ready yet. I am still, you know, in the process. Okay. I am still in the process. And a very, it's an unfair question, but I'll ask no, it please. anyway. Would it hurt you politically if you converted and became a Jew? Can uh, somebody who is not Catholic become president of Peru? Mm -hmm. Be honest with me now. Absolutely. I think so, maybe. 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 I haven't thought about it. But okay. be be because two uh, reasons. First is that there is no anti-Semitic, anti um, uh, there's no real anti-Semitism no, in Peru. No, in Peru, no. The Jewish community is very well seen. It's a very small community, 3,000 people in Peru, relative to 30 million. But most of them are really prominent and prestigious people in the academia, politics, uh, private sector, uh, public sector too. So um, the image of the Jewish community in Peru is in, is in a very high level. Uh, so let's talk about Israel for a moment. Hmm? Um, we say that there is very little anti-Semitism in Peru, and that's my understanding as well from the study we've done. And by the way, I happen to have, my hometown is called Stamford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Stamford, Connecticut's twin city is, a, a, basically the, the capital of Peru is the city that my hometown is tied to. And it just so happens that as we're taping, the mayor of Stamford is a member of my Chavura, a wonderful guy named David Martin. And David Martin and Marty Levine, who is his right hand also mm -hmm. in my congregation, both of them just w visited Peru, and I heard lovely things about your country in that regard. Um, but one of the things that I understand is that throughout Latin America, the issue of where Israel is and how countries relate to Israel and to what extent is there a, an understanding or a lack of understanding of the Middle East and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and is Israel vilified? Are there people who want to delegitimize and basically undermine the existence of the State of Israel? These are all issues that are percolating throughout the world. Talk to me for a moment about, number one, how does Peru in general, what's been the historical relationship between Peru and Israel? And what do you want to, what do you, what, what do you want to have happen? Should you become president of Peru? What would you like to see the dynamic and the relationship between your country and Israel be? Just talk to me for a bit about your feelings about Israel. Yeah, absolutely. Latin American countries, and particularly Peru, play a really important role in the 40s in the creation of, the Israel, of, of Israel. So this, uh, the ties and the support of Peru in the 40s was really, really strong and really important. And that uh, was followed in the 50s. Around the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s, there was a shift in foreign policy. There was a military government in Peru 
who start to be biased favoring uh, the Palestinian uh, agenda. Uh, then, after the military regime finished, from the 80s till now, the position of Peru has been a neutral, inertial position. It looks like this is not a priority for me. I'm going to do uh, what most of the emerging world is doing. So until now, information about what's going on in the Middle East, uh, neutrality, and also just following the majority or what the majority is doing has been the rule in Peru, I will say, in the last 30 years. So I think there is a big opportunity here. It's a big opportunity because nobody is seeing the benefits to link Peru and Latin America to Israel in the future and also the benefits for Israel. And if you have a country in which most of the countries, uh, you know, doesn't have the information, it's much easier to create a platform for a new agenda. And one of the things that I will do is two things, in a very progressively and calm way. Two options, foreign policy and economic policy. In foreign policy, you need to be, uh, you need to have first a platform of countries that progressively have more information on what's going on. I'm going to tell you one example. In 2014, three ambassadors in Latin America were called after the Israel-Palestine uh, conflict. It was Peru, Brazil, and Chile. And you know who was the country who convinced the other one to do that? Peru. Peru. President Humala, through their uh, foreign uh, minister, called the other countries to try to get like a common position. That's it, and the other ones agree because it wasn't a priority. So this is the power of a president. Uh, this is the power of, of, of a president in a country like Peru could have to do those kinds of things, to be ready, to be prepared. The second one is economic policy because economics drives po uh, politics. And then we have a bunch of options that haven't made, um, you know, pushed. First, a free trade agreement. If you sign a free trade agreement with Israel, you're going to cause two things. First, it's going to be really difficult for Peru in the future to have a political position against Israel because it's your trade partner. Second, you're going to force your neighbors to sign free trade agreements with Israel because Latin American countries right now are competing day by day to get commercial preference around the world through free trade agreements. If Peru signs a free trade agreement with, with Israel, I'm going to push Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, maybe Bolivia, to have free trade agreements with Israel. The, the second one, investment accords. There is no investment accords between Peru and Israel. If you got something like that, you're going to create a differences in competitiveness in Peru relative to other countries. The other thing that you can do is that now in Latin America has been created a platform really important for the U.S., which is the Pacific Alliance. The Pacific Alliance is a platform composed by Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile to be a counterpart of what's going on to other countries who are aligned more to a non-U.S. interest, Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Ecuador. The, the Pacific Alliance is a platform that it's very aligned to U.S. interests. But one of the accords of the alliance is to create an office around the world who promotes innovation and technology for all this platform to develop over time. And they have decided that the office needs to be placed in Israel. And you know who is going to be the president who is going to implement that? Me. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. The other opportunity in economics in Peru is that if we project in the future the conflicts that are going to be in the Middle East, what I see is future boycotts toward Israel. One thing has happened in Europe with, I think it's one telecom uh, company that started some kind of boycotts against Israel. So Latin America could be a new market just to diversify because this is going to happen in the future. So if this is going to happen in the future, I need to assure new markets mm -hmm. if something is happening. And Latin America is a huge and growing market for Israel. If you go to Peru and you ask everybody in the streets, not an educated people, in the streets, to what concepts do you 
relate Israel? They will tell you three things. Military, really strong military. Secondly, innovation and technology. And third, education, universities. Everybody knows that. So we have the advantage of has an assets that are in the minds of Peruvians that Israel is a good thing. And I don't have anything against them. So we need to take advantage of that. This is a very, uh, this is a base to build things. And if we do these policies, free trade agreements, investment agreements, programs linked Peruvian and Israeli university for student exchange, what is going to happen in the next 10 years, Mark, is that it's going to be really difficult for a president, even if the, if the next president after, after me, that said something or do something against. Mm -hmm. And the other countries are going to follow because they don't want to lose you know, space for, for competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of things that really concrete that you need to do for the, in the first day. One of the things that I learned about the FTA is that Peru start negotiating a uh, free trade agreement with Israel in 2013. They did. They did. But the negotiation stopped. Because? Because one congressman, one out of the 130, was against. And why? There was an American congressman? No. A Peruvian, a Peruvian congressman. A Peruvian member of Congress. It's yeah. not called Congress. It's called Parliament? Uh, it's not. It's called Congress. It is called Congress. Yes. There was a member of the Peruvian Congress who was opposed to a free trade agreement with Israel. Yeah. Why? Why? Because uh, he had personal, you know, a personal agenda there. But and, my and one Peruvian congressman yeah. could block it? Yes. Why? Why? And that's why I'm saying this is a huge opportunity. Why? Because nobody cares. Mm. And because nobody cares, just one can stop that. But if the president of Peru cares, it's easy to mm -hmm. go to the other way. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying we are losing a huge opportunity here. Mm -hmm. And we don't need just to deal with the problems that we have now. I know that the Iran-US uh, accord is really important. I know that the things that are happening in Europe now are really scary and important. But we need to deal with not only with the present problems, but seeing the future. What is going to be the future? And the future is telling us that we have a huge continent that is a promise, an opportunity, starting for Peru. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a wonderful vision. Um, by the way, is there in Peru any serious Islamic or Muslim population? No, but we have a very significant risk. And the risk is that Iran is already present in three Latin American countries. Yes. Yeah, Venezuela, Bolivia, and Nicaragua. Is the presence of Hezbollah in any way a threat in Peru? Indirectly. How? <sighs> Drug dealing. Part of the financial... Uh, support that Hezbollah has, it's from drug dealing in Peru and Bolivia. And that's another issue. That's another issue. The president of Peru has the power to deal with most of the drug dealing problem in Latin America. Because Peru and Bolivia and Colombia are the, thir uh, the three of the, you know, the countries that explain 100% of the, of, of the uh, production of drugs in the world. And my, I am afraid that also the, the financial freedom that countries like Iran is going to have will give you more possibilities to get into other places in the world. Mm -hmm. Mark, I, I lived with terrorism for 25 years. What does that mean? Peru suffered the hatred of Shining Path. We, had, we have been living with terrorism for 25 years. 70,000 Peruvians were killed because of terrorism. When I was a boy, I remember that once I was, uh, I, uh, in the middle of the night, I just woke up because there was a bomb. And my mom told me, oh, kid, just, just sleep, it's just a bomb. I was accustomed, Mark, to go to the streets and to the university. And if I found a backpack just you know, left in a corner, I was scared, and I was running from there. I, I, I was uh, a youngster, 
And I, when I found a box, I was calling the, the police. I don't want that for my daughter. I don't want my daughter to be anxious all the time and as I was. Mm -hmm. I don't want my daughter to be scared every single day of their life. That's another reason I, why, I, um, why I understand Jewish community and Israel. Because if you have, have not suffered discrimination, you cannot understand discrimination. If you haven't suffered terrorism, you cannot understand what it is. So don't tell me what to do with terrorists if you haven't dealt with them in your life. I have passed through that experience, and I don't want that. So terrorism is a really serious and really, it, it's, a, it's a illness in society that prevent you to be happy, you, your children, your family. You don't want to prevent that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure I understand something. You're telling me that inside the Peruvian, if, if, I, if I were in Peru, I would not have a sense that the Peruvian people are either anti-Semitic or anti-Israel. Is that what you're saying to me? Yes. Do they have any sense, therefore, about who's right and who's wrong in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? No. It's just like it doesn't matter to them. Correct. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think that Peruvians, we live seeing our bellies, and we don't raise our, our sight and see the future and see the world and see what could be the role of Peru in the world. And one of the things that the best contributions of Peru in the world is telling that. You know, we, we are a very small country, but we have experienced this terrorism. And I want to show you, all of you, what is this about? Because I don't want you to get involved in things that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. Live under terrorism is a really serious thing involving families, happy as to, uh, uh, family, children in general. So I think um, we can, um, we can uh, expand our experience uh, based on what uh, happened in Peru in the past. It has been wonderful talking to you and meeting you. You're Thank an extraordinary. You. By the way, is there Shabbat in your home with Michelle? Yes. Describe yeah. Shabbat for me. What well, do you love about it? Well, one of the things that we do is we we uh, we use the candles yes. every, every single Saturday. Every, every, Friday night. Every, yes, exactly. And we go with with my little daughter, with Claire, and uh, Michelle starts singing in Hebrew. And uh, after the singing, we share the bread, the challah, the challah, which we have the huge ones, yes. and we have also <laughs> the little ones. My daughter cannot uh, cannot eat it yet. But what I love about it is the sense of family. Yes. Is the sense when we are there, we are just the three of us. Yes. And the two candles that we that that That's uh, beautiful. That, uh, that, uh, that we use and uh, and also the um, this is really an intimate space for us every single week and. Um, that's lovely. It has been fabulous meeting you. No, Mark, it you was are, a pleasure. You, I wish you, in Hebrew we say, kol tu v'hatzlachal, goodness and success. Thank you. Uh, it would be wonderful, I believe, if one day I could call you Mr. President. And uh, the only thing is you have to promise me that as busy as you are, somehow either you'll see me in Peru or you'll come back and sit at this chair once you're president. Excellent. And we'll talk about the journey you, you are continuing to take. But you have the opportunity to do something very, very special. Thank you. to make this world a better place. You have such a beautiful heart and you have an extraordinary mind. So it has been an honor meeting you and I wish you every success possible. And may you only go from strength to strength. You can do wonderful. By the way, Julio, you will do wonderful things. It'll just be in what platform. I'd love it to be from the stage of the presidency of Peru. But I know that I'll be watching you and you'll be making marvelous contributions to your community and to your country and to your world and to your family. It's an honor meeting you. Thank Mark, you. Mark, thank you so much. The honor is mine. And I'm going to be president. <laughs> and when I'm going to be president, I'm going to be here talking to thank you. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thanks very, a lot. Thank, thank you. you very much. Julio Guzman, very well may be president of Peru. 
The first round of elections are in April of 2016. We'll follow. Of course, as always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to anything you've heard on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, our Facebook wall, or tweet me. I hope to hear from many of you. My thanks this week to a very special friend, Thane Rosenbaum, for helping to arrange our meeting with Julio Guzman. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends. Good life. Jewish Education in Media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.